Well, thanks very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak here. The talks have been very, very useful to us in getting overviews. Um, also, I appreciate from, I know how long these conferences can become. People continue to come. My father was a psychiatrist and I was always amazed that he could spend all day listening to people talk about their problems. <laughs> then I realized really mathematicians do exactly the same thing. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you about some of my problems. Wow. We're, uh, this is some joint work with Rocky Blair and Alex Lubotsky that grew out of hearing Alex talk about some of his work at another conference some years ago. It is working, but maybe I need to talk louder. <laughs> so I'll talk louder. Uh, okay, so let me give you the general drift of the talk. Um, our idea, the idea that came up from listening to Alex's talk was to transplant techniques for constructing representations of discrete groups to profinite groups. And there were two unexpected things that happened that I'm going to describe. First of all, the pro profinite case sometimes becomes much easier with better results than the discrete case. And um, well, maybe that's not totally surprising. But the other interesting thing was that when you take some of the work of uh, Grunwald and Lubatsky and you do the profinite version, you can settle an old problem uh, from the 1990s about something called the growth state Teichmiller group, which is a problem in Galois theory. So I'll first talk about the group theory and then I'll talk about the number theory. Okay. Here is the setting for the group theory part. Uh, take a discrete free group on D elements and look at its automorphism group. So an automorphism of this discrete free group, you have to say where the generators go and they have to go to another set of generators and any choice is fine. Um, and what, Grunwald and Lubotsky did in 2009 was to construct some big linear representations of finite index subgroups of that automorphism group, where the image was a sort of large arithmetic group. This had been a problem open for a while. Um, and the next slide is sort of the most important slide here because it gives their construction. It's a very pretty construction, good theoretic construction. So, I'm gonna spend a while on this. Um, what they did was they took a surjection from the free group on D generators onto some finite group. And then they looked at the kernel of that surjection. And they looked at the automorphisms of the free group that preserved the projection. So that, um, what do I wanna say? Uh, you take the automorphism so that when you compose first the automorphism and then the projection into H, you get the original projection H. Okay, so uh, those things are certainly going to preserve the kernel and they will have finite index. That subgroup will have finite index in the full group of automorphisms because it's, H is a finite group, right? And so you can only change the projection in finite many ways. So you end up with a exact sequence like this. Uh, you start with the exact sequence from the free group to the finite group with kernel R, and then you divide the left and the right by the commutator subgroup of the relations. Okay. So R mod the commutator of R is a nice abelian group. Uh, the free group mod the commutator of R, certainly not in general. But what they did was to look at um, what happens when you do the following. Uh, look at R bar now as it has a natural action of this subgroup A of pi, because A of pi is preserving the projection pi. So A of pi acts on R bar. And uh, when they looked at, what they looked at was what is the image of the action of the automorphisms of the free group that preserves the map to H? How big a subgroup of automorphisms do you get for uh, R bar? This, relations mod the commutator. So to recap, you start with the full group of automorphisms of FD. You look at the subgroup that preserves a projection to a finite group. That subgroup automatically acts on the kernel of the surjection of H modus commutator. 
that action turns out to preserve the natural conjugation action of H on this abelian subgroup, R bar. Uh, and what they wanted to, what they proved, which was really kind of a difficult proof, was that the image is large, that the set of automorphisms of R bar that preserve the H action that come from automorphisms of the free group is actually a pretty big arithmetic group. It has finite index in the arithmetic group that's the kernel of all homomorphisms of that uh, G to GL1 uh, that are defined over Q. So R bar is a finitely generated abelian group in our case. So these, I'll do an example here to sort of illustrate how this turns out. Maybe the example is more clear than the general state. Um, let's do an example. Okay, so take H to be Z mod P uh, for some prime, and you look at the integral group ring inside the rational group. Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't, I, I'm not entirely, I think it probably is, yes, I think so, yes. Okay. Uh, look at the integral group ring of this cyclic group of order P inside the rational group ring. Rational group ring is just the sum of Q and uh, the P th field of P through of unity. Now, as, an Z, as a QH module, Q tensor R bar looks like this. This is a classical result of Gauguin's, I think, that as a module for this group ring of the cyclic group, you just get a one-dimensional trivial representation plus a certain number of copies of the free module, where D was the number of generators of the original uh, free group. And the GZ, that's the, the uh, ZH automorphisms of R bar, uh, ends up being commensurable with, well, what you would expect, GL of D of Z cross GL D minus one of the uh, ring of P through of unity, and the subgroup, that's the kernel of, uh, all homomorphisms to GL1 defined over Z looks like SLDZ cross SLD minus one of that uh, cyclotomic integer ring. So the, to recap here, in this case, if you look at the action of the automorphisms of the free group on D generators that preserve the homomorphism to the cyclic group of order P, you get a subgroup of finite index inside this uh, SLDZ cross SLD minus one ZZ P as the, uh, group of automorphisms of the R bar from the earlier construction. But I should say that their construction makes it really hard to figure out what the true image is, right? They get a subgroup of finite index in that um, automorphism group, but what it is is a little tricky. Also, I should say there was an extra hypothesis there. They needed to have at least um, one generator of the free group that mapped to the trivial element of the finite group H. And so this is really a hard calculation, actually, the, the calculation of the discrete case was difficult. Okay, so upshot is we can make big homomorphisms from the automorphism group of a free group onto the product of these kinds of SLD and SLD minus ones of various things. Okay, so uh, the profinite case Yes, yes, that was, the, that was the, 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 the essential technique. Exactly, that's the technique. Um, now the profinite case, surprisingly, turns out to be much easier and uh, more pleasant. Uh, so let me give you the rundown on that. Um, if you take uh, this, replace the free discrete group on D generators by its profinite completion. Uh, now again, we use a subjection onto a finite group and I'll call the kernel R. Uh, now we again get this kind of exact sequence uh, from this setup. And that sequence has, it's an extension of H by this abelian group. So any extension of a finite group, uh, a finitely generated abelian group has a certain extension class in the finite group H2 of H with coefficients in R bar. So what you can do is say, look at all the automorphisms of R bar that preserve the, action, the conjugation action of H and also don't change the extension class. Right? You 
under the same extension clause. Our bar is, uh, it's gonna be a quotient of a finite number of copies of Z hat, of the pro finite completion of Z. That's what you mean. So um, when you look at the automorphisms of our bar that respect the H action and also fix that extension class, then again, we're always going to have an, auto, uh, an action of the automorphisms of the free pro finite group that preserve the projection of H on this R bar. And that, um, those automorphisms produce elements in this automorphism group that preserve the extension class. But in fact, the map is surjective. You know exactly what the image is. So let me put that another way. If we start with uh, an automorphism of R bar that preserves the H extension and, preser and preserves the extension class, we can come up with an automorphism of the free profinic group that produces that. So the nice thing here is the surjectivity of the map. So let me give you an idea. Why is this true? There's a, a miracle that uh, Alex is, a, it's, it's his bread and butter. Um, it's a famous lemma of Gauguet's. Uh, no, no, Gauguet's lemma says that if you have a surjection, surjective homomorphism of finitely progenerated profile groups, and the number of topical, topolo topological generators of the G1 is less than equal to D, and you, set a, you take some set of D topological generators for G2, then um, you can find a set of topological, topological generators of G1 that will map to exactly the set of topological generators of G2 that you specified. Um, so there's an uh, yeah, it should be D. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, it's D, it should be D. Uh, there's a proof by Broquette. It's a fascinating proof. It's really a counting argument. Uh, they work finite group by finite group. They reduce to the case where G1 and G2 are finite. And then they try to figure out, well, how many ways could you have picked an S1 uh, that would do this? And uh, eventually they show that number is positive. So it's a very, very slick proof in Broquette's book. And the, the upshot of this is if you have a closed normal subgroup of the free group, free profinite group on degenerators, every automorphism of this quotient of the free profinite group by that normal subgroup can be lifted to an actual automorphism of free group. Uh, that's certainly not the case in the discrete world, but in the profinite world, it is true. And here's why this gives us this result the main theme here is the corollary, actually, that you can lift automorphisms of quotients of these free profinite groups to actual automorphisms of the free profinite group. So if we go back to the situation we have here, if I start with something that's an automorphism of our bar that preserves the H action and the beta action, well, by definition of extension classes, you have a isomorphism of our bar to itself, the identity map from H to itself, so we can extend that to an automorphism of the term in the middle of sequence two. So that's an automorphism of a finite quotient of the free profinite group on degenerators. But the theorem of Gauchot says that automorphism of the thing in the middle can be lifted to an automorphism of the actual free group. So that's why Gauchot's theorem gives us pretty quickly this result. Okay, so this was all a nice, pleasant, accident uh, in group theory. But when I heard Alex talk about this, I mean, I said, oh, why don't we do this for our three core finite groups? Because I had in mind this uh, famous, some famous problems coming from. Right, 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 exactly. You have to show that that works. Yeah. You can hand, assign it to your graduate student. For sure. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, now let's see how we can use this because the, the tool we have is now we have a way of constructing via this group theory uh, rep big representations of the automorphism group 
of the profinite completion of a free group. But the most important <laughs> profinite completion of a free group for number for Gawa theory is just the free group on two generators because of this famous theorem of Bailey. So Bailey proved that there's an injection from the Gawa group of Q bar over Q into the automorphism group of um, a profinite free group on two generators. So this is a very surprising theory. And this is the, the start of a lot of uh, interesting developments. Uh, let me explain briefly where it comes from. Uh, I'm gonna to try to do it without a lot of a tall cohomology, so I'll stick with Gawa cohomology. Um, take the maximal extension of the function field in one variable over Q bar that's unramified outside, in effect, three points, outside three discrete valuations, which correspond to zero, one, and infinity. Uh, so you then have this tower of fields, the function field over Q of T and then Q bar of T up to this guy that's the maximal algebraic extension unramified outside the three evaluations. Every, anytime you have a triple of fields like that, and they're all Gawa over each other, you get this sequence of Gawa groups. Um, and the nice thing here is that we can identify these groups. On the right side, the Gawa group of Q bar of T over Q of T, well, that's really just the Gawa group of Q bar over Q. So on the right, we have the Gawa group of Q bar over Q. Now on the left side, let me say what the left side turns out to be. That's the tall fundamental group of P1 of Q bar minus three points. But we know that the tall fundamental group of such an affine curve is just a profinite completion of the topological fundamental group. And the topological fundamental, fundamental group is a free, free group on two generators, two loops around uh, zero and one. So the sequence we had on the last page is this um, sequence. You have a pro-free group on two generators mapping into this big Galois group into the Galois group of Q bar over Q. Now, anytime you have a homomorphism like that, you get a canonical homomorphism from the group on the right into the outer automorphisms of the group on the left, just by lifting and then conjugating. But Bailey, in this 1979 paper, um, used the decomposition groups of points over zero and one to refine that map to an actual injection uh, to the automorphism group itself of F2 hat. Um, it's a somewhat involved argument, uh, not that complicated. You just have to realize you might be able to do it. Um, and the interesting thing is to prove it's injective. We use the fact that any number can come up as the J invariant, any algebraic number can come up as a J invariant of an elliptic curve. That is a branch cover of P1 branched over three points to prove that it was injective. So this Bailey map is a very mysterious thing. Um, people have tried very hard to identify what is the image of uh, the Galois group of Q bar over Q into this automorphism group of a free pro, free, pro free group on two generators, because that thing is somehow more combinatorical. In principle, to define such an automorphism, you just need to say where the two generators go. Um, and that led to this thing called the grothnik teichmuller group. I guess there's going to be a conference about this in, in a little while, uh, which has produced a lot of interesting work. Um, take the two topological generators, um, pro-generators of F2 hat, coming from the inertia groups over zero and one. And uh, Grinfeld and Grothnik wrote down a proposal to describe what is the subgroup of the automorphism group of a free pro finite group on two generators that is the Gallo group of Q bar over Q, which would be quite remarkable. Um, you just need to know somehow some rules or restrictions on where the two topological generators go. And so um, they managed to produce a group, and I'll, I'll suppress the details in a minute, but they produced a group that they could show actually does contain the Gower group of Q bar over Q. And the main question of in Grothny's uh, Esquistian program was whether this is actually uh, equal. Have we captured the Gower group of Q bar over Q in a much more combinatorical way? And this is where we come back eventually to representations, because if this is true, certainly every Gower representation, every representation of GQ 
should lift to this GT hat group. So um, now I'm going to suppress the precise definition of GT hat. Um, I'll show you briefly what it starts to look like. Um, you have to say, where do the two generators X and Y go? And there is a recipe or restrictions on where they can go. Um, this is mainly just to show that it's somewhat complicated. Um, it has to do with finding compatible sequences of automorphisms of the fundamental groups of the moduli spaces of curves of genus zero uh, with a certain number of mark points. You wanna produce compatible sequences of automorphisms of those fundamental groups. And the, the case when you have genus zero curve minus four points, that's really fundamental group of that turns out to be pi one of P one minus three points. So there is a reason for making these restrictions, but I'm not going to spend any time on that. What I wanna talk about is the question of Loschak and Schneps from the 1970s. Uh, they wanted to know, can you construct a non-abelian non finite dimensional representations of the Gal group of Q bar over Q with large image, infinite order image, that actually lifts to GT hat. I mean, the definition of GT hat sort of gives you easy abelian representations that lift to GT hat, uh, abelian Gal representations. But the question was, can you find a non-abelian one? And uh, we actually can, using the cofinite version of the grunwald Lubatsky construction. Uh, in fact, they're very nice representations. They're ones that are very natural for number theorists. They're from adelic tape modules of uh, generalized Jacobians of curves. But um, I call it a leapfrog strategy because what we end up doing is to not deal with GT hat at all and all of that horrible complication on the last slide. Uh, we prove that these representations lift to finite index subgroups of the full automorphism. So then of course they're gonna lift to finite index subgroup GT hat. Um, and we can construct some that lift all the way to the automorphism group of that. So um, someone pointed out that uh, Loshak wrote a review of this paper and uh, was basically complaining that we weren't saying anything about GT hat. We were, we were bypassing the problem. But in fact, I'll talk a little bit about how this kind of question of how far can you lift representations might actually have something, might have something to say about GT hat from the point of view of uh, obstructions. Um, the last thing I wanna mention here is that these adelic tape modules of generalized Jacobians they really correspond to modular forms of weight two um, in the case of modular curves. And I can, if I take Jacobians of uh, modular curves with full level structure, then these Tate modules are associated to weight two uh, modular forms uh, of a certain level. So the natural question is if you take other automorphic representations, uh, when, which ones can you extend? to find an index subgroups of the automorphism group of F2. I think that's kind of an interesting question. And I'll say something about that toward the end of the talk. Um, okay, so let me see here, what do I want to say here? This is how the uh, case of Tate modules of Jacobians works. Uh, if you take a smooth projective irreducible curve of the algebraic closure of Q, uh, Bailey proved this famous theorem that there's always a non-constant morphism to P1 uh, unramified outside zero one and infinity. So that's a remarkable characterization of um, smooth projective irreducible curves over Q bar. So let's take a curve like that and uh, X and then take the Galois closure of its function field over the function field of P1 and this then we get our finite quotient of F2 hat from that because the etal fundamental group of P1 minus three points is this F2 hat. And now we produced a finite quotient of that group. And now we're in a situation where we can use the grunwald lubatsky construction. Uh, and the only problem is how do we interpret what R bar is, what the kernel mod its commutator is. And that's a famous result of Many people, but I'll say Sayre in his uh, record of class, that R bar is a Galois group of the maximal abelian cover of Y that's unramified 
outside the set of points of Y that lie over zero one M infinity. And uh, that can be identified with what's called the adelic Tate module of the generalized Jacobian. The, gener the, the generalized Jacobian, if you uh, look at the inverse limit of its torsion points of all orders, uh, that's the uh, adelic Tate module. So this is an object that uh, arithmetic geometers are fairly comfortable with. And it comes up in a natural way from the grunewald lubatsky construction. So I guess the gist of this is that if you look at uh, the Atoll fundamental group of P1 of Q bar minus three points, um, inside that F2 hat, you can construct sub quotients that are uh, Tate modules of generalized Jacobians of curves. And because of that, we can use these group theoretic arguments to produce actions of large subgroups of the automorphism group of F2 hat on those Tate modules, generalized Jacobians. Any Gal representation that we can produce as a subquotient of that F2 hat will have some subgroup of the automorphism group of F2 hat acting naturally. Um, and in this case, we can, if we, you do some more work and uh, you do the, the, the main question now is to make sure that the action of such a subgroup of the automorphism group of F2 hat is compatible with the Galois action and Bailey's injection, right? So these Tate modules of generalized Jacobians, all these curves are defined over Q bar. The Tate modules are going to have actions by finite index subgroups of the Galois group of Q bar over Q. And we'd like to make sure that that action by this Galois group is compatible with the Bailey map. When I take the Galois group and I put it into the automorphism group of F2 hat, and then I use the action of the subgroup of F2, automorphism group of F2 hat that comes from the uh, grunewald Dubotsky construction. You have to make sure these things are compatible with each other. And that, it actually is a certain amount of work uh, to do that. But um, this is what I mentioned before. If you take a modular curve, uh, F is gonna be allelian over Q and we can take the action and it's related to modular forms of weight two. Okay. so. What about X and Y? What about X and Y? X and Y. So you go back, X was a smooth projective curve over Q bar. Uh, y is also, um, I just take the Galois closure. I take the Galois, X is now a cover of P1 of Q bar, branched over three points. And I take the Galois closure of that cover. That's the Y. I need something that's Galois with group H that's finite in order to use this grunewald lebowski trick. That was the idea. Uh, okay. All right. So what else do I want to talk about? Um, yeah, and this is what we ended up proving. So if you look at a big enough number field and you look at the natural action of the Galois group of Q bar over Q on the allylic Tate module, it comes from letting automorphisms act on torsion points on these generalized Jacobians, then that extends to an action of a finite index subgroup of the automorphism group of F2 hat with respect to the Bailey embedding, right? When you take the Gawa, the Gawa group into the automorphism group of F2 hat. Um, there is a certain amount of uh, fussing to make, you have to increase F to make sure that the two actions are going to coincide. Um, okay, so, and then of course you get an action of a finite index subgroup of the growth new Teichmiller group. And these are examples that uh, Loshak has stepped for interesting way. I should say that you can, we had to take this original curve over P1. That Bailey said any curve over Q bar can be realized as a branch cover P1 branched over three points. And we had to pass to the Galois closure. But in fact, you, once you deal with the Galois closure curve, which was Y, you can then prove a similar result when you go back to the original curve. Uh, talk about the action of Galois on the uh, adelic Tate module of X with respect to the Branch points. Um, okay, so what I want to say here, I, I should do one example. I should actually do one, at least one example of this. Um, take this curve, uh, which is mm, Galois over Q bar of T. Uh, it's the function field of an affine elliptic curve. And uh, that's a cyclic Z mod three cover of P1 branched over three points. And when you look at the um, Adelic Tate module, 
of that curve with respect to the points over zero, one, and infinity, um, which are all fully ramified, then actually the tape module of the elliptic curve itself looks like a z hat plus z hat. Um, and the kernel, because we're doing generalized Jacobians, you get the sum of two copies of the uh, cyclotomic twist of z hat, the inverse limit of the nth roots of unity. So this adelic tape module is this rank four thing. Um, and we're going to get um, an action of the Galois group of uh, some number field on that adelic tape module lifted to a finite index subgroup of the automorphism group of F2A. Okay, so that's, and there is an interesting problem here, namely these adelic tape modules of generalized Jacobians are gonna to map to the actual adelic tape module of the Jacobian itself. We only get this theorem for the tape module of the generalized Jacobian. But you can ask yourself, can you descend to the tape module itself? I think in this case you can. In other cases, we could not do that. So there's some interesting obstructions. But let me make some final comments of this about this. Um, the quest natural question is, well, we're always talking about lifting to a finite index subgroup, right? And the automorphism group of F2 hat. You can actually build very large Galo covers of P1, so you can lift the Galo action all the way to the automorphism group of F2 hat. So there are definitely non-trivial examples where you can extend to all of GTM. But there are obstructions to doing this. I mean, you, you can't, um, in general, get all the way to the automorphism group of F2 hat in a way that's consistent with Bailey's embedding. So uh, I think of this as actually a way to study GT hat uh, because you could, there is, a, there is a method to find the maximal subgroups for which we can extend the, the action. And then one of them should contain GT hat. So what you need to true or show is that the uh, conditions defining when an automorphism is in GT hat force you to be in at least one of these um, finite index subgroups. Yeah. Oh, um, in a TSY you take the generalized Jacobian. So that's the uh, generalized Jacobian. So the generalized Jacobian is an extension of the actual Jacobian yeah. by a torus. You have an here? Yes. Yes, uh, it's, a, it's an extension of that by two copies of GM, uh, or actually three copies of GM, corresponding to the fact that you want to look at um, extensions or covers, so to speak, of the elliptic curve, where you allow ramification uh, over some points, yeah. over the inverse image of zero, one, and infinity on the elliptic curve. So there will actually be three points Right? Three points involved, zero, one, infinity, they're all totally ramified in this elliptic curve. So there's three points, and you're trying to classify, you know, covers of the elliptic curve that are unramified outside those three points. Okay. And because of those three points, you end up with an extra torx. That's the generalized Jacobi. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're interested in whether we can, let me say more generally what the idea is here. Um, if you have a family of Galois representations like these tape modules, they're constructed group theoretically um, from that Galois group. Um, you have this question about how, do, how far can you lift the Galois action on those things to an action of a finite index subgroup or a big subgroup of the automorphism group of F2 hat. And there will be families of obstructions to lifting those representations. And um, whatever those obstructions are, they should all vanish when you look at the subgroup of the automorphism group of F2 hat that's given by GT hat. So um, the question is, can we show that's true when you write down this complicated definition of GT hat? Uh, you want to prove that all the obstructions to lifting um, Galois citations up to subgroups of F2 hat definitely vanish on those GT hat automorphisms. Uh, in fact, you know, what, what's the subgroup that comes from the family of all tape modules of generalized Jacobians? And each, for each generalized tape module, we get finitely many obstructions, but you could have infinitely many because there's lots of tape modules. 
me say a few other things. Here's another direction. Um, Grunewald, Lubatsky, Larson, and Malstein replaced the automorphism of the discrete, the automorphism group of the discrete free group on degenerators by the automorphism group of the fundamental group of a uh, Riemann surface of genus G, which is very natural to do if you think about mapping class groups. Uh, that automorphism group is close to the mapping class group of curves of genus G. Um, now, things are a little more complicated because this fundamental group is a quotient of a free group by one relation. And unfortunately, the Gajut's lemma that made everything work uh, doesn't work <laughs> once you put in that one relation. Uh, it's interesting to try to repair that. Uh, but as a result, we don't have a counterpart for the profinite case, the profinite completion of pi one of sigma g of the result we can prove for the automorphism group of FD hat. That's an interesting, interesting counting question because I said that Gajutsa's lemma was really a counting argument. Um, now you've got to do a much more subtle counting argument because of that relation. Uh, yeah, it's an open problem. I mentioned something about weight two cusp forms. Let me say a little bit about that. Uh, if we take a principal congruence modular curve of even level, um, it's a Galois cover of P1 branched over zero one infinity. And if you look, uh, maybe I ought to make that sure those primes are primed at N. Uh, the Galois associated way two cusp forms of level N is just the homomorphisms from the uh, delictate module to QL. So we got an action of the automorphism group of um, a finite index subgroup of the automorphism group of F2 hat on the delictate module there of, of the, the generalized Jacobian. So we get one act uh, we get an action on the scalar oxidation of weight two cusp forms. So the two things are kind of equivalent. Um, so when you see that, you um, ask yourself, well, what about higher weight forms? And higher weight uh, modular forms or a congress of some level or very natural Gower oxidations. So you'd like to know how far can we lift those in the subgroups of the automorphism group of FD. And uh, let me just say a little bit about this. Um, this is not, it's not clear how to do this yet, but I'll say a little bit about it from talking to Richard Taylor over the summer. Um, the, action, the, the idea is that um, how do you write down the Gower citation associated to weight K forms, uh, K group bigger than equal to two? Um, well, there's a standard recipe going back to Deline for how to do that. Uh, you look at the universal family elliptic curves with level n structure um, over the complement of the cusps in the modular curve. And you look at uh, the elliptic tape module of the base change all the way up to this maximal and ramified outside zero one and infinity extension. The Gower group of that maximal and ramified outside zero one infinity extension over the function field of the modular curve um, obviously is going to play a role here. And Deline shows that the elliptic representation to weight associated weight two K forms is given by a first cohomology group of a symmetric power of that elliptic tape module. So when K equals two, the symmetric K minus second power is just the zeroth power. And so you get what I talked about in the last slide. But the problem here is that we want to try to take that Gower representation and get an automorphism group of some subgroup of the automorphism group of F2 hat to act on it. And if you have to, if you want to do that, you need to get some natural action of a subgroup of automorphism group of F2 hat on the symmetric power. Right? And that's the, if you're going to try to make sense of this question of lifting a Gower representation to an action of a big subgroup of the automorphism group of F2 hat, you have to somehow realize the Gower representation in terms of the group theory of F2 hat. And well, there are some ideas about how to do that. Um, I'll just say one last slide about that. Uh, there, well, two maybe. There is a way to try to do this um, by using more complicated subfields, um, the union of all the function fields of modular curves of level n times the power of that prime L we're dealing with. And if you, the idea in this slide is that we need to 
realize this symmetric power of the Celery Tate module in a group theoretical way. So you can write down various sub quotients of the group gamma that at least set theoretically can be identified with the Calidate Tate module. And then what you could do on the next slide is to say that if you do that, you can look at the sub, a subgroup of the automorphism group of F2 hat that preserves the various groups that are involved in realizing this Calidate Tate module uh, as a sub quotient. And you just put conditions on the subgroup of F2 hat that give you um, an action of a subgroup, H tilde, on the LA tape module. Um, so basically, you look for the largest subgroup of the automorphism group F2 hat for which we can make a sensible definition of the action of that subgroup on this K minus second symmetric power of the LA tape module. And then you'd be able to look at its action on this first cohomology group because it's going to be acting on gamma as well. But you know, then the question is, can you ensure that this subgroup of odd F2 hat is acting in a way that's compatible with the Bailey map? Uh, so this is sort of directions for future research that might, might end up giving us some more information about what this growth nick teichmiller group really is by sort of having a look at it from the point of view of obstructions, the lifting Garup citations to the subgroups of odd F2 hat. And that's pretty much all I had to say. Thank you very much for your lecture. Are there questions? Yeah. <laughs> you could use two. Mention um, a, a generalized ver version of conjectural generalized version of the Gashut's lemma. Yeah. Um, so can you? Is there a state, can you state um, more, is there a general Ooh. version or? Well, what would we need? I mean, I mean, the right thing is to ask, what would you need in order to do that? Um, what would we need here? Well, you know, the real question is, if you take an automorphism of a finite quotient of the pro-finite completion, Pi one of sigma g. Uh, when can you lift to it? Lift it to an actual automorphism. Okay. And in the case of the free group, the profinite completion of a free group, Gajus's lemma says exactly that that is always possible. Right. Like any automorphism on a finite quotient, lift it all the way. But in this case, you don't expect that to happen uh, because of the relationship. There'll be an obstruction. So then the question is, what extra conditions do you need on an automorphism of a finite quotient of pi one sigma g hat in order to be able to lift it all the way up? Yeah, okay, that, thanks. That yeah. should be, you know, there's very interesting questions about counting number of representations of uh, pi one of sigma g into finite groups. I mean, this is something that uh, Fernando Rodriguez Villegas and uh, people like that Think about counting, right? How many representations? And Gershutz's lemma is ultimately a counting argument. So you have to take his counting argument and adapt it to this. That gets really interesting, but much more complicated. Okay, no, thanks. Other questions? So maybe I have one. So, um, in, uh, about what you had been at the end of your talk. Yeah. Is there a relationship with uh, Shimura reciprocity? Ah, Shimura reciprocity. Yeah. Well, we ended up using Shimura reciprocity in some examples <laughs> yeah, to, to, try to, to try to identify how far we could lift things. Sometimes that's useful. Um, but sort of you're asking if I understand, I mean, the question would be, Shimura reciprocity law will tell you um, how Frobenius automorphisms act. Tells you what? Shimura reciprocity law tells you how Frobenius automorphisms act on tape Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. So now what you'd like to know is how do you generalize that to actions of automorphism groups of F2 
elements of the automorphism that, that act on the tape module. I don't know, but maybe there is some kind of generalization that MRS and Prosody is a big subgroup of automorphism in F2F. That'd be a great, that'd be a great theory. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's thanks again the speaker. Thank you. Thank you.